So I'm a data scientist, and uh, I got involved in trying to look at microbiome data about almost 10 years ago. And I work with David Relman. And we have a lot of um, challenges from that type of data. Um, I'd say that the challenges mainly come from the heterogeneity and many types of information leaks that occur along the way. Also, the fact that we have to make many choices when we're analyzing the data, and that makes the reproducibility of the study at the end questionable. And uh, I won't have time to talk about all of those things, but I'll give you some pointers to ways in which you can um, look at further solutions to those problems. So homogeneous data, are all alike, and all heterogeneous data are heterogeneous in their own way. And I'd say that the heterogeneity of the data that we have here is at many different levels. So we have the status of some of the variables. So for instance, um, I'll talk at the end about a study we did on preterm birth. In that case, um, the time of pregnancy was the main um, response variable that we were trying to explain. Sometimes it's very simple variables like states of health and state of illness in IBS or something like that. And other times we don't have a clear response variable that we're trying to predict. And that gives rise to methods which we try to find what's hidden. And you might have hidden gradients on the one hand or hidden clustering variables on the other. Those are latent variables that we have to tease out from the data. Data. And it, it's sort of harder. The supervised learning problem is easier because we know what the gold standard is. The latent variable um, problem is harder. We also have very, from a computer point of view, we have all different types of data. So we have trees and networks and binary data and continuous variables that are measured. We can have also images and locations of the samples along the track. All of those make for a level of heterogeneity in the formatting, which is difficult. And then we have dependency. That is, many of our studies are longitudinal or they're spatial, so the samples are dependent. And each different lab, and the labs keep changing, have different technologies. So we started off doing Sanger sequencing, then we did 454. Now we're doing Illumina. Moving on, we might be doing Nanopore. Mass spec data for metabolomics are important, so we have to integrate those. So those are the challenges for somebody doing data science in this area. So I'll show you a few um, ideas about how we can combine the data on trees or combine the OTU tables together and combine the different layers. So if we get to the nitty gritty about what are the data that we're interested in, in, from a biological point of view, we can say that the communities are made up of different species, taxa, or OTUs. Those are all names that people use, sort of interchangeable. And we can measure those in what's called the microbiome. And so the microbiome is made up of all the different species. And the metagenome is made up of all the genes that are there in the different species. And it might not matter which species the genes come from. It's just that they live in symbiosis and they are a meta-organism in some sense. And so they work together. So the genetic component sometimes is quite challenging because a lot of the databases, they work on an organism level. So getting annotation for metagenomes is quite challenging. We do transcriptomics, so RNA-seq data, so we can measure what's being expressed. Um, and metabolomics um, is to find out what is actually there in terms of metabolites and proteins. So we have to bring all of this together. And we have some data um, on different um, parts of the body. So here, these are all phylogenetic trees which show in the tree of bacterial life, in some sense, where do these samples have a certain abundance. So the red dots that you see um, show the presence of certain bacteria in certain parts of the body. And one of the things that you notice is it's all across 
um, the different trees, uh, the different species are across the whole body. And so there's not one type or one part of the tree which is attached necessarily to only one body part. And th that's something that we might want to compare sp specimens. And in some sense, this is a place where ecology, evolutionary biology, meets medicine. And up to now, the methods that are used in ecology have been used for looking at the microbiome. But there's a problem because when you want to test, you need to have m a much stronger hold on what the uncertainty is because you need to be able to make clinical decisions. And so in some sense, people think, oh, I'll have to have a p-value. It might not be a p-value, but you will have to make a decision. And so you have to be able to quantify the uncertainty. To start with, the ecological approach um, takes all of this data and makes multivariate plots and multi-table analysis of them. And so let's get a little bit more precise about what the data are today. Well, we have one particular gene which is used in all the bacteria as a fingerprint, and that's the 16-srRNA gene. And the abundance of that gene in the different samples will tell us the abundance of the specific bacteria up to a, you know, some, we have some error, there's some overlap, but certainly that's the goal. We have RNA and we look at the transcriptomics and we can look at the gene expression in the standard way. And we have metabolomics that we also combine together. One of the things which is the most important about this, and it's a lesson that we learned in some sense the hard way, is in order to make any sense of all of this data, it has to be attached to all the clinical variables. That is, uh, we have longitudinal data, we have time series. We need to know that these variables are connected together with what we have um, in terms of the OTU abundances. And unfortunately, these get detached and people talk about metadata uh, as if it's not data. And so we've tried to make a structure, a heterogeneous data object, which combines all together the OTU data, the clinical data, the sequence data into one workflow. So I work, I use Bioconductor because it enables me to do um, reproducible research. So we made a tool called PhiloSeq, and now we have a, a, a tool upstream for taking the sequences, which is called Data2, and that gives us a complete reproducible workflow on which we work with our collaborators on both using the clinical variable, but also the uncertainty that we have on, on different aspects. Um, so I'm not going to uh, explain in detail. I'll just show you why we want to look at the uncertainty. So for instance, this is a study, a typical multivariate study, where the output is two different groups. We have um, a group of patients before and after taking antibiotics. And so D2, D1, that's the same patient. Um, E2, E1, the same patient, and D2 is after antibiotics, and um, F2 is the same thing. So we want to be able to say not only there's a change, but how sure we are of the change. And so this is a study um, done by um, David Relman, and we're trying to pursue, here we have only three patients, now we have a study undergoing a longitudinal analysis of um, 150 patients, so we'll have a better idea of the uncertainty, but we do, do, do try to make plots, and that's done by doing, I'll just show you the output in some sense. The type of output that we're aiming for are, instead of confidence intervals, we want confidence regions, but we want to make plots where we can see how sure we are of the output. And that requires making a statistical model of the noise, where we are often use the negative binomial, and we use you know, dependency and other variables that we combine um, to make plots like this, which show the the uncertainty. And the, um, we have a useful first order approximation of the combinations of the different tables using an extension of 
correlation coefficients that you all know. And instead of having correlation, we use multivariate, multi-table correlations. So we can combine time series of abundances. We can combine the multivariate contingency tables, or the OTU tables, with the clinical variables. Um, I'm just going to wrap up uh, with the, the conclusions and the lessons that we learned. We've had to rationalize our data summaries and make uh, structures which embed all the data together so that we don't lose any of what's called the metadata. And we package everything together in structures that enable our collaborators to redo an, an, our analysis in, uh, in, in the standard way. And so many of these things are available through my lab, and um, I benefited a lot from the fact that people do work in a reproducible way, and um, he here are the people who made some of the tools, and you can look at my website to find out more. But um, that's... Uh